Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the um, Reparations in Action. The Justice League of Greater Lansing, Michigan is our highlight. It is brought to you today by the Reparatory Justice Series, Atoning for Injustice and Building of Future Together, the Interfaith Reparations Table of the National Council of Churches. Um, and part of that Council of Churches, you have the Presbyterian Church, the United Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, the Sisters of Mercy Network Lobby, um, Church World Service, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, uh, the Episcopal Church Network, I said Network Lobby and Religious Action Center. And of course, the center that I represent is the Center for Reparatory Justice, Transformation and Remediation. My name is Antonia. I am the daughter of William and the, the heartbeat of Joyce and the program coordinator for said center. Welcome, please go ahead in the chat put your um, your name, your organization, and where you are from, and we will be glad to engage you uh, even further. Uh, okay. You would think that after all this time of being in this world, that we would have this all together. Here we go. We're going to open this moment up in a moment of centering and prayer. So if you all wouldn't mind just joining me in breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out, inhale love, exhale hate, inhale peace, exhale chaos, inhale joy, exhale War, war, inhale love, exhale love. Creating and sustaining eternal wonder, we are a group of humans who are appreciative of the collective breaths that we just took. We breathe in the love that we have for one another and exhale implicit biases. We breathe for this space in time to come and reason together. Reasoning in the cause for reparations, reparations for a people who have yet received them. Reasoning in the plight of a community's commitment to healing and racial justice. Reasoning not out of charity, but out of a reckoning that calls for writing course and committing not to repeat that which has caused harm. It is in the name of the one whose joy I have that the world did it give and most certainly cannot be taken away. Ashe and amen. So can y'all believe that they asked me to do a theological thought? So here we go. Recipience is my favorite word. I love the word recipients. It's a long, interesting word to spell. And yes, it's one of those SAT words. But I came across this word from a dear friend of mine whose name is Reverend Vahisha Hassan. And recipients is the repentance, recognition of a past mistake, especially with the desire to improve in the future. <laughs> 
And when I think about that word, I think of not just the um, the uh, the thoughts or the adinkra symbol of Sankofa, whereas you, you honor the past with your feet uh, in the present and the egg in the mouth for the future. It's not just that, but there is a repairing. Isaiah 58 and 12 speaks to the repairing of breaches that the ancient ruins will be rebuilt. And when I think of the ancient ruins, it's not, it's not just, you know, the building up of the broken people, but of their minds, of that their minds will return back to the time of the gloriness of who the people were, not just within the states, but reaching back over to the traditions in Africa. So um, as we continue forward, always can remember to uh, follow the recipient's journey in that your minds will be changed, not just your mind, but your heart and your soul and everything that is within you to not return to the place where we were because we don't want to go back to Jim Crow laws. We don't want to go back to Jane Crow cities. We don't want to go back to sundown towns. We don't want to go back to salt, salt mines and uh, new age enslavement. No, we want to move forward from this place that we are now and build as a beloved community together the ants ate the elephant so with that i turn it over to my dear friend let me get his slide keith keith go ahead and take it away thank you so much antonia uh, welcome everyone thanks for welcoming us thank you for that word of theological context for us. Um, thank you all of you for joining us. Uh, this is a great group of folks and uh, I am with the National Council of Churches. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work through the Interfaith Repertory Justice Table and with other partners as well on the issue of repertory justice and looking at reparations. Um, we come today at, at a point where it, it within the space of reparations and repertory justice and racial justice, uh, there are a lot of disparate efforts and a lot of disparate uh, successes and not so successes. Um, nationally, uh, there have been repeated efforts and continued efforts to work towards legislation uh, to establish a reparation a commission to study reparations. Uh, that's known as HR 40, uh, sponsored by Rep uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. Um, to date, uh, that has not been able to be passed by the House. Uh, we are continuing to work on that. We're also working with the White House to attempt to get the provisions of that bill enacted in the form of uh, an executive order. Um, the National Council of Churches, along with hundreds of other faith leaders, sent a letter to the White House demanding just that uh, a couple of months ago this past spring. And we were happy to host a number of folks at the White House, uh, outside the White House, to raise the holy ruckus uh, in June, on Juneteenth, to continue to raise the cause of reparations on the national level. Um, increasingly, as we do this work, however, we're discovering that the work is happening. Whether or not the federal government does something, the work is happening. It's happening in a number of places. Uh, as people have typed in where they're from and what they're doing, I've noticed a lot of folks that have been uh, working with uh, reparations in their own context, in their own churches, in their own communities. Uh, we have examples from places such as Evanston, Illinois. We have uh, the Maryland Episcopal Diocese. We have Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, the state of Illinois is working towards a reparations process. The state of California is working towards a reparations process. There are numerous other examples, which I haven't even touched on yet, um, that uh, have, have sprung up uh, out of a desire to do justice and to continue to wrestle with a history that, is, uh, that has set us in this place where 
one particular group of people hold all the power and all the keys and have all the privilege while others are left wanting and wronged and oppressed. And so it's good that faith communities, especially uh, interfaith communities deal with these questions and really explore what it means to be faithful and what it means to repair the breach. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, our guests from the Justice League of Greater Lansing. Uh, they, as you see on the screen there, their calling words are repairing the breach. They're looking to find ways of repairing the wrongs that have been done within their own communities uh, around them there. Uh, joining us today, we have the a spiritual and intellectual leader of, of the movement in Lansing, uh, Willie Bryan. Uh, Willie joins us. She is with the uh, Justice League. We also have Prince Solis, who's the president of the Justice League of Greater Lansing. And then in addition, we have Reverend Rebecca Anderson, who is the associate pastor at the Presbyterian, Presbyterian Church of Okemos in Michigan as well. So we're looking forward to hearing from the three of you about your experience in Lansing. What, what has God worked through you in Lansing and what, uh, what, what can we learn from your experience and your tireless efforts and vision there in Lansing? And welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you. I would Thank invite you. you to just go, yeah, to go ahead and present your story to us so that we can learn a bit about what your context is like, what you all are, have done and are doing, and maybe try, we can try to pull some lessons from that. All right. Thank you. Rebecca will start us off. Thank you, Willie. My task with you all today is to share with you some of the theological aspects of why we make a case for reparations as part of our work with the uh, Justice League of Greater Lansing. And when I speak about this, I feel so inclined to draw on Black leaders and Black theologians that have inspired for me many of a far deeper understanding of how deep the wounds of racism and white supremacy go. Because as a white woman, I can understand the pain. I can empathize with it. And the best way I can do that, though, is through the stories and the, the honest words that we hear from people who have experienced it firsthand. So one of the ways that I really found myself so deeply in understanding um, or how I cultivated a deeper understanding for just how deep the wounds of racism and white supremacy go from a theological standpoint was through the work of James Cone. Uh, as a student pursuing my MDiv, I read in systematic theology, James Cone's work, God of the Oppressed. And one of the words that he shares in his book that really struck me, he said, are we not all oppressed, especially those who think that their freedom is found in social, political, and economic uh, domination of others? Those words struck me so deeply because in this work that was so much about those who had been oppressed by those in power, Cohn sits there and deeply understands that it is those who inflict the oppression who are often the most harmed, who keep a wall between themselves and the suffering of others and create disunity and disconnection, which is so antithetical to what our faith calls us to do, which is to connect with others through that unconditional love of God. So. It's our understanding through the work of the Justice League of Greater Lansing that racism and white supremacy are wounds that deeply impact those who have been oppressed by the legacy of racism. But beyond that, they also cause these deep wounds that many uh, people who continue to contribute to oppression in ways that they're aware of and in ways that they're not aware of might not realize. And so it's our work to create reconciliation and healing. And the way that we do that though, is not just by talking about it. It is by taking actual action that works to empower those who have historically been oppressed. 
And it's our belief too, that for those who have often been in the places of power that have led to the most oppression and the most pain, it's really our belief that by actually taking steps towards making financial reparations and working in these active and concrete ways towards reconciliation, that we can promote healing for those who are oppressed, yes, but for those who have the deep wounds of causing oppression themselves. So I want to end with some words by a woman named Austin Channing Brown, who I would say is best known for her work, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a Word uh, in a World Made for Whiteness. I was especially led to share her words because she too is a person who has deep roots in Michigan, not far from where we are in Lansing. And she said in uh, this quote that I'm about to share with you, she speaks about a great misconception in the work of reconciliation. She says, a great many people believe that reconciliation boils down to dialogue, conference on race, a lecture, a moving sermon about the diversity we'll see in heaven. But dialogue is productive toward reconciliation only when it leads to action when it inverts power and pursues justice for those who are most marginalized. Unfortunately, most reconciliation conversations spend their time teaching white people about racism. In too many churches and organizations, listening to the hurt and pain of people of color is the end of the road rather than the beginning. And so I share that with you because we are an organization that deeply cares about the work of reconciliation, about the work of creating transformation that takes seriously what Antonia shared about repairing the breach. But we also see listening to people of color, listening to those who have been oppressed, not as the end of the road, but as the beginning and as a call to move beyond dialogue, but to action. And so uh, with that uh, said, I want to turn it over to some of our next parts of our conversation, which are how we do that through the work of reparations. Thank you so much. And I'm so delighted to be with you today. Thank you, Rebecca. I am the next speaker, and I'm going to share with you um, uh, my screen so that you can follow along with uh, this part of the presentation. All right, so all right, let me see if I got the right one here. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and um all right, so we are the Justice League of Greater. Lansing, Michigan. And um, I'd like to start by just giving you an overview of uh, what we'll talk about today. And um, the we, we'll touch on and speak about the historical background on reparations, because it's always good to start at that foundation. <clears throat> so the first, the uh, we're going to talk about reparations themselves. Uh, are, are in fact they needed? Are they needed for African Americans? I mean, we always hear that argument uh, that do we need them? We're going to talk about the racial wealth gap and how that impacts our need for reparations. We also want to present solutions, not just talk about it, and we will show you the Justice League model. So reparations for African Americans. The main questions that we want to answer, and we always have to address these uh, as long as 400 years we've been talking about it, but we still have to address the need uh, to answer these questions. Like principally, what are reparations? And uh, I submit that we will define it as the word comes from repair. So then reparation means to make amends for a historical wrong that has been done 
Um, it could be done by countries, it certainly could be done by institutions, but uh, we want to address this wrong for African Americans in the US. So then it ultimately, why do African Americans need reparations? And so that's the, the bulk of our talk today uh, that we will present is that for African Americans, why is why is there a problem with wealth accumulation? And we want to talk about the impediments, why African Americans are 400 years later talking about the need for um, wealth accumulation and how has that impacted our community. So we're going to talk about a few of the impediments, and it's just a few. You know, there's, there's so uh, many more, but we're going to touch on the ones that um, most egregious in our evaluation, slavery, of course, we always start with um, the Homestead Act. Let's talk about those a minute. Uh, the GI Bill, sharecropping, Jim Crow, redlining, and the destruction of Black communities. And, and I um, want to make sure we're mentioning that this is not an exhaustive list. We could go on. Um, slavery, America's original sin. Now, when, as we go through these, I want you to think about impediments, missed opportunities while we we're in the state, at the state we we're in. Uh, child slavery in the US has been deemed one of the most brutal forms of slavery in world history. Uh, we always get a response sometimes like, you know, you know, America's not the only place that had slavery. So we like to emphasize that, that the brutality is unparalleled and that the US wealth, remembering that the US is the wealthiest country in the world and that this wealth that we enjoy and certainly the largest society enjoys was built on slavery. <clears throat> After 246 years of enslavement, there was emancipation. Um, and again, let's take a missed opportunity. In 1865, President Lincoln tried. He tried to do compensation, allocating 400,000 acres along the eastern coast of the U.S. to formerly enslaved individuals. The plan was to have each individual, each uh, formerly enslaved person, receive 40 acres. And um, if that had stayed true. Imagine the amount of land and how that could have been uh, part of our heritage. Uh, however, as we all know, of course, that President Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. And so the um, that fall, the new president, Andrew Johnson, overturned the order and removed all of the folk from the land and gave the land back to the Confederate uh, contingent that brought war on the country. This, of course, we all know is a derivation of 40 acres and a mule. It was also a thought that we would, in addition to the 40 acres, that the army had lots of mules and maybe they could, uh, the war was ending now and maybe each person could also get a mule. Um, and we know that did not happen and the land was, in fact, rescinded. Missed opportunity. The Homestead Act, everybody um, probably familiar with this, but we'll just talk about it in a minute. Uh, there were two Homestead Acts. And of course, in 1862, um, African Americans were not eligible. That was bondage was still in force. Uh, but in 1866, there was the Southern Homestead Act that Black people were allowed, are able to participate in. But in remembering, this was 1866, just a year uh, after the emancipation of all folk had happened. So you had many impediments just within that. Um, during slavery, it was against the law to teach folk to read and write. So most African-Americans didn't know how to do that because you had to, to 
uh, get the land. This was free land, you know, westward expansion, southern expansion. And, and the idea was, of course, all you had to do was make an application that were uh, uh, five years, stay on the land and improve the land. Application cost was about $20, but you hear all of the impediments in there. $20, difficult for folk who had um, no job, no place, no home, no. And so the upside of that is that about 246 acres, million acres of um, land was given to, freely given to homesteaders. And the um, about 1.6 million white families became landowners. And that's important, became landowners, whereas only about 45,000 African-Americans received these final land patents because you get that final patent after staying on the land and improving it for five, five years. It was very difficult for African-Americans to, even if they made it, it was very difficult for them to even keep the land and many people did lose it. So again, an impediment to wealth accumulation. Sharecropping, another very unfair system of land ownership, sharing land with African-American farmers from landowners and remembering that um, this happened after reconstruction. Reconstruction again was the experiment that would, had it worked, had it stayed in place, we would not be having this conversation. We would not be talking about a reparation. So ideally the sharing would be 60-40, but this was another brutal system that was akin to slavery that, and black sharecroppers never gained adequate proceeds from the land owners. This picture here is showing an aftermath of sharecropping. You see the picture at the top um, behind me is the house I grew up in. My father was a sharecropper. My father built this house from the savings that he was able to accumulate from sharecropping. And he built the house. My family grew up in this house. There's no one lives in it now. However, the picture below me there is a representation of what the house looks like for the landowner who profited from uh, black farmers work in the land and they received all of the funds, black farmers. And this was such a brutal system that this started after, uh, after reconstruction and lasted on through the 19, uh, up to the 19 and sometimes into the 1970s. So you can see how long this unfair and, and, and really again, akin to slavery system lasted. Another uh, missed opportunity. Jim Crow laws, the system of laws and executive orders that legalized, and that's a powerful word there, legalized segregation and discrimination. Again, another system akin to, to, to uh, the enslavement period. And it kept up the tr tradition and made wealth for white people. You, you could see that this uh, picture represents <clears throat> what uh, the privileges were Black people could only drink from this fountain. You know, same this this same thing held true for jobs, housing, and uh, just the general way of life that was an impediment to Black people uh, gaining wealth. The GI Bill, same situation here. The government, this this of course we know the GI Bill was passed after World War II to uh, help the veterans returning home. Now, uh, African American and white veterans were returning home. However, the, the, the glaring problem here became that the states were allowed to dispense the loans. And you know the problems with that. So by 1947, only two of 3,200 uh, veteran loans in 13 Mississippi cities went to uh, black bar, two. And then the North wasn't much better. New York, New Jersey suburbs, fewer than 100 of the 67,000 mortgages went to uh, people who were not white. Uh, this was also the period of uh, the rise of suburbia. So 
uh, it, most people here probably will know what Levittown were. Levittown is just one of the representations of, of the rise of suburbia. It's certainly not the only one. But this was a period late 40s and 50s where um, su suburbs rose up and um, advantaged white people. Black people were not allowed to, you could see that you could see these houses still exist today. Uh, this, these are not houses that are torn down. And when these houses were built, they were uh, cost between seven to $9,000. Today, these same houses are worth 300 to, to $500,000, half mil. And um, so families who got these houses and again, the whole GI Bill, piece that a lot of, of folk were able to take advantage of here was not, um, Black people were not able to take advantage of those uh, GI loans. You know, most of the time people hear the GI Bill and veterans got the money. You think all veterans, and I, I've talked to veterans who, white veterans who were surprised. They they thought all, all people got it. It's like, that's how I went to school or that's how I, bought my home and not realizing that African-American veterans did not have that same opportunity. So again, a missed, missed opportunity and, and impediment to wealth. The other thing you saw Levittown there, William Levitt built these homes and he's you know just one of, the, one of the builders, but he was very famous for just saying, I am not going to sell my houses to black people. That's it. Uh, hands down, and that that was um, the law of. I mean, no one forced him to be equitable, so he was allowed to do that. And again, a disadvantage for the black veterans and African Americans. Redlining. We all know this system, and, and it was a, this was enforced by the government. These maps were were, were generated in the thirties, nineteen thirty five, and and on. And the idea was that um, the government mandated to mortgage lenders <clears throat> and to real estate developers to not sell randomly to black people. So they were segregated in areas. And so to, to, to demonstrate that and to know what, where black people could buy homes was the maps were colored in so that the green area, obviously, here were, were the green areas where white people were best areas, so they would sell and, and so forth. Blue was still desirable, yellow declining, but red was deemed hazardous, and only black people and only black people were allowed to purchase um, homes in these areas. In fact, the real estate developers and the mortgage lenders just would not give people loans in other areas. Now, one of the things, this is a map of Lansing, where we are, where we are and East Lansing, which is the, the community that houses Michigan State University. And if you notice the difference here, in East Lansing, there are no red zones. And I know it, everybody can understand why. Uh, Antonia mentioned it. Uh, East Lansing was listed as one of the uh, sundown cities, meaning uh, Black people were not allowed to buy homes in East Lansing until 1968. And that's recent history for most, for many of us. So 19, before 1960, when the Fair Housing Act was signed in 1968, it's when Black people were able to purchase homes. So, you know, there's a lot we could say about redlining and we all, um, again, know, know that history, but this is an impediment to black people not being able to own homes. These green areas here, we can, we can all of us, the three of us could put our hands on where these are and who lives there. Today, you lay a map, current map over this map, it looks the same. These are black neighborhoods. Another impediment. Uh, um, most uh, all around, all across the country, most many cities did, uh, and they did, did it under different labels. Uh, uh, this 
here in Lansing, the highway, major interstate that goes around Lansing, uh, I-496 was built through the heart of the neighbor, Black neighborhood. So the, you're looking at a building here that was a Black business that was torn down. This was a drugstore. It was torn down, of course, to, along with 800 other, uh, 800 or so other homes and businesses and churches uh, uh, that were destroyed to build the highway through and no, very little compensation, you know, went into eminent domain. Folk were not adequately compensated for having lost their home. There was a recent documentary, documentary produced called, and they also took the dirt. Um, it describes uh, the destruction of the Black community in the name of putting through the highways. Uh, I think it was opened in about 1968. And this happened all around the country. It's not unique to Lansing. Uh, uh, very few communities escaped. And if it wasn't this kind of destruction, it might be just terrorism, where folk uh, would go in and burn down a, a Black city. We know the, the, the whole piece on Tulsa. You know that that, that recently was um, brought to an end with the court case and the last two people alive that had been in Tulsa were denied any compensation. I, that's another whole conversation that I still am uh, struggling, struggling with. But the, the destruction of communities is another impediment to having obtained wealth. So that all of those have brought us to the place where we're talking about the racial wealth divide. Uh, wealth is simply the sum of what a family owns minus what they owe. And for many people, that means that if you have a, uh, if you lose your job on Friday, you have no place to live on Monday. And um, so a family's wealth accumulation is the amount of wealth they inherit from their families. And we've just been showing the impediments to that happening. Just a, just a graphic here to, to demonstrate. Uh, this graph shows the median wealth by race in this country. So it, it goes over a 30 year period. So it shows what happened in on the left two bars, we show 1983 and, and 30 years later, uh, all Americans showing about $82,000 in median household wealth. And then if we separate that out by race, we're looking at white America. In, in, in 2016, 140, 7,000 um, median household wealth. And then when you look at, at Black America, you know, it's really obscene that we're talking for median, uh, and it dropped from, in 30 years uh, from about 7,000 down to about $3,500 in, in um, household wealth. A little bit better for Latinx populations. But this demonstrates demonstrates its cause and what can we do about it? We, uh, how can we fix it? This was also mentioned earlier. Keith mentioned the uh, HR 40 that's in Congress right now. John Conyers right here from Michigan uh, introduced this in 1989 and nothing happened. It never left committee. After John's death, Sheila Jackson Lee took that up and uh, had got and got it introduced, brought to the floor of the house. But it's still there, still on the floor of the house. It hasn't been passed, hasn't gone to, to the Senate. And so the Justice League was developed out of this knowledge, uh, frustration, and understanding of how can we fix it? What can we do? That got best, the best scenario would be that the government would take care of it. That hasn't happened. We're still struggling with that. So we at the Justice League decided to stop sitting on our hands and stop talking about how awful it is and stop the, the feelings of guilt and talk about reconciliation. So we acted. And, and my our colleague is going to talk about what we did and, and, and our, what our model looks like. I want to turn it over to Prince right now. 
Prince Solis is our president with the Justice League of Greater Lansing. Thank you, Willie, and thank Take you. Take it Rebecca. away, Prince. Thank you, Willie. <laughs> um, as you can see in, in this slide, it, it states that, you know, Willie uh, was the founder of the Justice League and the idea for this faith-based model for reparations, which really uh, stems from the congregation uh, here at Lansing First Press and many other, you know, congregations in the community that would ask, you know, what can we do about the racial injustices and social injustices that are faced by African Americans? And, you know, this was the conversation taking place inside the church through the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Trayvon Martin. And so, being the bold leader that she is, Willie stepped forward and said, you know, reparations. And we looked at the under undercurrent of it all. And so um, nearly two years later, the Justice League has gained a lot of momentum. It's a very personal project for me because I grew up in the city of Lansing. I'm 33 years old. I've lived here for 32 years. And so uh, the people in this community, um, are very personal to me. And so um, I think the work that we're doing is gaining a lot of traction. And I'll talk to you more about that as we go along in the slide. So what is the vision of the Justice League? The Justice League of Greater Lansing, Michigan has cemented our commitment to healing and becoming the beloved community by making the connection between faith and racial justice in the form of reparations. In the Greater Lansing area, reparations will be committed mainly from predominantly white houses of worship as part of their efforts to repair the breach caused by centuries of slavery, inequality of wealth accumulation, and the failure to live into God's plan of equality for all of humanity. So it's really um, important to remember that there are uh, a handful of models uh, for reparations that are starting to uh, uh, gain more momentum at the national level. And Keith pointed this out earlier, what makes the Justice League unique is that it is uh, on the foundation of a faith-based model. So we seek to develop a network, again, of predominantly white houses of worship from the greater Lansing area to create a reparations endowment fund to make amends for the historic wrongs perpetrated on the African-American community. And later in the slide, we'll show you uh, what progress we've made um, in that area and, and, and collaboration. So there's one scripture that truly resonates with uh, the work that we've been doing over the past couple of years. And uh, that's Isaiah 58, 12. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repair of the breach the restore of streets to live in. So really living into uh, the notion of repairing the breach um, spiritually, as well as through, through the uh, wealth inequities. So the Justice League focuses on securing funds uh, in, in one of many ways through church endowments. So one of the things we talk about is how many church endowments have grown exponentially over the centuries due to their complicity uh, in the legacy of slavery. Um, and so we say, hey, if as a predominantly white church, you understand the complicity of the church within the legacy of slavery, and you would like to help to repair the breach, um, that this is a way for you to be proactive in doing so. And so, um, that's that's one way that we're able to secure funds. A second way is just through personal contributions. If someone wanted to, uh, for example, go to the Justice League's website today and make a personal contribution, maybe they heard about us through a community engagement or project and they wanted to contribute, they could do so. Another option is through estate planning. And lastly, through asset donations. And uh, I'm very honored to say that we've actually been able to uh, check off all of these boxes in terms of how people have chosen to contribute uh, toward this overall project of uh, helping gain reparations for the 100,000 African Americans in the Greater Lansing region. 
So the suggested use of funds would be in three primary areas, uh, which would be housing, scholarships and education, as well as uh, grants for African-American owned startup businesses. And that's the blueprint that we've started with. Who would make the decisions as to you know, how these funds are, are allocated in those three core areas? Uh, well, we thought it would be um, constructive and empowering to have uh, an, an all black advisory council uh, that's made up from different professionals in different sectors from the greater Lansing area. And so what you're looking at are um, a handful of individuals with experience, not only uh, within the church as pastors, but also those with experience in economic development, being uh, a student advisor. Um, we have a historian that's on our team, as well as we have uh, one of our council members who specializes in uh, gender studies and LGBTQ. So we wanted to be diversified within our team uh, and empower them to, to help make these uh, decisions for the community in which they're from. Some of the goals that we've accomplished um, between 2022 and this year are electing our officers, electing board of directors, uh, naming the advisory council, that recent slide we just went through. We also opened up a bank account um, with a black owned bank called Liberty Bank that's based uh, in Detroit. And we also were able to um, use the Justice League's public relations team to launch our new website and design our logo. Our big accomplishment, of course, is becoming approved. Um, as a federal nonprofit by the IRS. So we are officially a 501c3. Okay, so what you're looking at here is our leadership team. Um, so I currently serve as uh, president. You have Willie Bryan, who is the founder, as well as the vice president. We have Ben Rumba, who is the acting uh, treasurer, and Sally Campbell, who is serving as our secretary. Here are uh, a few of our uh, board of directors. Uh, uh, Miss Peggy Von Payne, uh, Reverend Stanley Jenkins, who is the pastor at Lansing First Presbyterian Church, Dr. Nikia Parker, who is a historian at Michigan State University, and Reverend Sean Holland, who is both in activism as well as a pastor here in the greater Lansing region. All right, so some of the things that I want to hone in on is that the Justice League keeps its goal uh, uh, focused on the local 100,000 African Americans in the greater Lansing area. So we are very aware that uh, we want our work to align with what's going on at a national scale. And as Keith alluded to earlier, you know, we would definitely want this to be a, uh, a federal um, uh, you know, federal enactment, but we are keeping our goal uh, focus on the local 100,000 African Americans in this area. We make sure that we emphasize that it's uh, repair and, and not an investment with expectation for personal return. It's not charity. Um, you know, and that's really important that we stress that. We live in a capitalistic society. And so for every dollar that one gives, they want a little bit of interest on that. But this is, uh, again, not for um, uh, charity and it's not an investment with an expectation for personal return. So for this year, we set a goal of raising a uh, million dollars uh, by the end of 2023. And recently our advisory council um, has made the decisions to um, roll out a certain percentage of what we currently have um, and, and the endowment to disperse towards education and scholarship. So that leg of reparations in the greater Lansing region. So we are not at a million dollars yet, but we are well on our way to that goal. What I'm gonna show you over the next couple of slides is just some of the impact we've been having at the local level. Um, the Presbyterian Church USA uh, as of last September, um, moved to introduce what's called the Litany of Repentance. And the Litany of Repentance is an apology 
um, that's offered by white identified Christians. And it goes into very vivid detail, um, apologizing for the legacy of slavery. That was issued by PCUSA. The Justice League felt that, hey, let's not let this uh, powerful, um, powerful document just sit, but let's put it to work. And so that's what we did. Uh, we worked with uh, the pastor and members of the congregation at Lansing First Press and other surrounding uh, congregations in the area to uh, take the apology into a predominantly uh, Black community at a predominantly Black church, uh, and the apology was offered. This is a picture here. Uh, we've officially done the apology three times. This was the second time uh, where we brought it to the uh, African American community, and this was January 28th of, of this year. Our most recent apology was at the uh, Michigan State Capitol, um, and this was uh, held on Juneteenth of, of this year, and we thought that it, it, it paired um, significantly, and we had uh, an authentic, organic response. Again, a lot of the community members who learned about the momentum of the Justice League and what our vision and mission is showed up. And a lot of the churches, as, and as well as spiritual centers, uh, showed up to um, participate. This is a picture of myself at the event. Um, we've done; we're doing our best to make sure that you know uh, both city and state officials are abreast of the work that we're doing. And so we asked uh, the Michigan State Senator Sarah Anthony to uh, participate. Um, in this apology and just offering her insight and her thoughts about uh, the work of the Justice League and the work of the, the church. And she's been of great support. In fact, she was at our second uh, apology uh, that we held earlier this year. Here is one of our advisory council members and also um, Reverend of a church uh, called Kingdom Ministries, which is on the south side of Lansing. This is Reverend Terrence King. And he also um, participated in the apology uh, on Juneteenth. This is Reverend Kit Carlson, who um, she leads All Saints Episcopal Church here in Lansing. And um, All Saints Episcopal Church has been of tremendous support for members of their congregation being a part of the Justice League team, but also recently um, All Saints Episcopal made the uh, very brave stance to uh, make a contribution to the Justice League after selling their rectory. Um, and we are going to be doing a community um, community presentation at All Saints to receive though, receive that contribution to put it into the reparations endowment. So uh, just one of the many uh, pastors and congregations that are remaining involved. And uh, this is my mom. So she's the reason why I'm here. And she's very, um, she's a strong force in my life. She keeps the fire. And what's been beautiful for me is as much work and time as we've dedicated to having community engagement, uh, my mother in her, uh, you know, elder stages of life, I can keep her informed and keep her engaged. And I think she's enjoying it. So that makes me happy. Here is a uh, broader shot of the apology that took place on uh, June 19th. Again, we had um, a very solid turnout. We had both the church and the unchurch show up and show out. We had um, an intergenerational um, aspect to this. As president of the Justice League, I know that it's really important that we make the dive into the youth in order for this to be long withstanding. I think we've captured the ears and the hearts of our elder population within the church, but I think also breathing some life into um, our younger population and getting them involved uh, is gonna be really helpful long-term. Okay, and then lastly, this is just a list of uh, some of the churches that have been involved with making monetary contributions toward the Justice League in the past. 
um, year and a half. And uh, so it, their support is going long ways. It, it gains more momentum. Uh, and of course, this doesn't um, constitute for all the individual uh, uh, contributions as well. And then lastly, I just want to invite you uh, to check out the Justice League's website. It's www.justiceleaguglm.org. And I think Antonia also put that in the uh, chat room. And then lastly, if you'd like to contact us, feel free to do so uh, at justiceleaguglm at gmail.com. And thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks to all of you for uh, sharing your story, sharing the story of, of Lansing, of the Justice League, of the Presbyterian Church. As it's working through that, as you see from the from that list of contributors, there are a lot of different different kinds of people that are getting getting involved in this process. A lot of different kinds of people of faith. Um, so we're grateful for your work that you've uh, undertaken to reach out to those other groups. Um, and in doing this very, very important work. Um, one question just to get our Q&A started, and folks, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the question and answer module at the bo bottom of your screen. Just click on that, you can type a question in there. Um, in terms of kind of the first steps, uh, you know, how, how uh, uh, the qu my question would be for those of us that are looking to get involved in this and to try to explore how our own congregations can get involved in the reparations movement and to look at this. Uh, what were some of the questions that had to be answered uh, at First Presbyterian and other places to uh, that the congregations had to grapple with? Um, I know, uh, speaking of my own personal experience, uh, getting my own head around the, the harms that Willie listed. Um, there's there's so many. Um, is there a, an exploration of things that the congregation itself has done to the community, or is it is the focus on uh, more uh, kind of the ways that we perpetuate and support the system, either directly or indirectly, uh, when looking at uh, how congregations uh, get involved in this? Well, one of the things that I think, and you probably will find this in, in, in any startup and when you talk about reparations, especially um, to be able to answer the questions that scare folk. And those questions are, what are you gonna do with the money? You know, that was one of the, the first pieces and uh, tell us how you're going to manage it. And, and so, that we had to be able to um, say to folk and and you know and calm fears that uh, we weren't taking a big vacation next week. But what we were doing uh, is that they the group has to release and they have to trust the the uh, managers of the uh, Justice League and understand that you know where our commitments are so that our advisory council, we had to continuously uh, bring that forward to talk about Prince's point there about this is not charity and it's also um, not monies that you have to release it. You have to reconcile, you have to uh, repent and, and understand that you, you're trusting now. Uh, Black folk, you're trusting African Americans to to understand and know what uh, their goals and aspirations are, and and that and look at it and understand that it is repair. It is not loaning. It is not charity. It is not. Uh, I want to give it to you and but tell you how to spend it. So that was one of our larger hurdles was to relate. You know. Uh, have folk understand that their fears of the traditional way to look at um, following the money trail, it was, didn't work and it doesn't work in this repair situation. You have to, you have to release and trust. Yeah, 
if I could uh, add to that, I also, um, I feel like there's been a lot of internal work that churches uh, have been doing, uh, predominantly white churches have been doing uh, as it relates to discussions about racial justice and social justice. And I think uh, the reason why the Justice League is so um, why it's such a catalyst is because it's enabled a lot of churches to um, to act uh, and to be able to align, you know, uh, what they talk about uh, in their racial justice and social justice groups and to see the broader picture of this. So I would say in addition to us going out and doing, you know, presentations and talking about the history of the legacy of slavery. We talk about it from the spiritual component. We talk about the economic component that churches have uh, started to align with these um, uh, with these tenants. And I think it's giving them the opportunity to kind of um, live into this notion of being a beloved community and repairing the breach. Um, and that's been really uh, special for me to witness and see when we look at how different churches and how individuals are uh, participating or contributing, uh, it's all very different. There's no cookie cutter approach to this. And I think to me that emphasizes where there's a will, there's a way and churches and community partners are finding a way to uh, align themselves. Thanks for that. I appreciate that, uh, that answer. A uh, couple other questions that have popped up. Um, one references, I think, some of the, the barriers, barriers that you may have encountered in your work. And Will, you spoke a bit about kind of the questions when it comes to money, people always want to know where it's coming from, where it's going, and who's responsible, and, and all of that. Are there other barriers? And Reverend Anson, I'd, I'd invite you into the conversation, especially within white churches. Um, folks that are, I know one one argument that I hear, not in, not in my communities, but in other communities um, sometimes is, well, you know, that we hear generally is, I, you know, I, I, it wasn't me. Uh, I didn't do the wrong. Um, I didn't have slaves. I didn't, you know, I'm poor too. I'm, you know, there's, there's a litany of, of pushbacks, as it were, to, to reparations and to the movement. And I'm curious, ha have you encountered those in your work? And how have you been able to uh, explain the larger context to, to folks as well? Thank you for that question. I I will say that, you know, there has been a lot of talk of reparations in the national news, particularly in California, as they grapple with what offering reparations to Black folks in the state of California might look like. And I would say, generally speaking, just about any sort of narrative that you hear around reparations in the broader society, you will hear in the church. Only oftentimes what hearing it in the church means is that there is this a kind of an added component of the religious aspect, which can sometimes heat up any intensity behind the argument, because when people's faith is involved, there's something very emotional there. And so I would say, as you had mentioned, a lot of what happens is, um, or a lot of what I've heard is, you know, I didn't do it. I wasn't responsible for it. I saw a question in the Q&A even of, uh, you know, in my congregation, in my context, we have people who are from other countries and people say, well, I wasn't even, my heritage isn't in the United States. My, my people did not own slaves. And the truth of the matter is that the white church, we have deeply rooted systems of white supremacy inherent in how we function. We continue to benefit from aspects of racism and white supremacy, both in the financial kind of leg up it's given us and in just the fact that you know, I love that Prince mentioned that the Justice League works with a black owned bank. You know, if someone sees, uh, if a white church attempts to get financial help, they will be given that uh, they are much more likely to get the help that they need than someone who's from a black congregation. 
it, it, I will say too that redlining continues to have a legacy in our community. Um, East Lansing was created as a result of redlining, but beyond that, my church, um, which is just, it's kind of um, the, the congregation that I serve is a lot of professors that teach in East Lansing at Michigan State, and a lot of our community was created out as just another byproduct of that redlining. So these are just I don't, I, in my head, I said, these are small things. They're not small things. These are quite big. They're maybe things that are not visible to us when we walk into a community. It was something coming in as a relatively new pastor and as a relatively new uh, person to this area and this community that I had to learn. It was not obvious to me as I walked into the community but it's very clear that the legacy of white supremacy continues to have bearing on the way that our churches function. And I think that a big part of what I try to share with people when these concerns come up is that we do have a role to play, even if we did not cause the harm, we continue to benefit from historic harms but also if no one takes steps towards repairing the breach, the pain and the hurt will continue to snowball. The choices that we make have the ability to heal generations that are coming up and to bring some healing to people who have been historically harmed. Beyond that, I will say there was reference to the apology for the sin of slavery and its aftermath, which was something that Willie Bryan worked on within uh, General Assembly at the PCUSA's level. There were many conversations. I, I led a discussion on the language of the apology, which was very meaningful. And it was very hard for some people for some of the same reasons that reparations are hard for people. You know, why am I apologizing for something that I didn't do? Why am I saying sorry if I didn't even grow up in the United States? Um, but, you know, the language of that apology is extremely powerful because it talks about the pain in the same way that as I opened, I said the biggest way that I can really understand the depth of hurt that has taken place because of racism is to listen to stories of people who've been impacted, that the language of the apology bears the footprints and the imprints of the pain that it has caused and it continues to cause. So we read it aloud together and I will say, I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. And when you are forced to look into the eyes of someone who is suffering, it is much harder to sit here and say that it didn't happen or that you have no responsibility to do something about that harm. And so I really, I feel that this is very common and popular right now in our world more broadly. And it's very, I think, meaningful and important in churches to do as well. But one of the most impactful things that we can do is to find people's stories and listen. We have relied heavily, I think, on like we've wanted Black people and Black folks to come forward and to tell us their stories. I think it's the job of us as white churches and white people to seek out those stories too, because Black folks have had to use a lot of energy to, um, to be heard. And so I think we have to want want to be, uh, we have to um, demonstrate that we want to hear. And part of how we can do that is to be the initiators of that action. So I hope, I feel I've gone on for a long time, but I hope that answers your question pretty comprehensively. Yes, thanks for that. Um, really, your Prince, did you want to say anything additionally? If not, we do have a couple other questions and we'll we're going to need to wrap down we are getting on in time here but i'll try and highlight or combine a couple of these questions uh together 
Um, there's some questions about uh, format, process, those types of things, um, ways in which uh, churches can go about having some of these conversations and how they affect the community at large, even beyond the, the community of faith. Um, are you seeing uh, are you seeing some effects within the broader community outside of even just faith communities? Are you seeing uh, you know you spoke of being at the at the state capitol? Um, is there attention being paid within the, the state legislative branch? Uh, are there those that are uh, taking action alongside the faith community with the faith community with with the uh, inspiration of the faith community, perhaps, and uh, within within the Lansingware? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll comment on that, and then Willie, if you want to kind of drive it home. Um, in this work, I like I always tell myself, I don't know if I ever told Willie this, but I say, if Willie takes the sky, I'll take the ground, right? And I, I think from that, from a, a number of, of of vantage points, number one, uh, you know, Willie and I, we 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 collaborate very well. In fact, when we were in Chicago, I think we were named like a good one, two, like a uh, combo or something like that. And that's because we are able to um, leverage our networks. And so I, um, like I said, I, I grew up in this city. And so this project is very personable and very meaningful to me. And so I've leveraged my relationship with community organizations from nonprofits that I've worked with since I was 16, 17 years of age, from a previous financial institution that I worked with, I reached out to their African American employee resource group to say, hey, this is the work that we're doing. I understand what your goal is, would you give us the opportunity to simply disseminate some information. And so um, I make sure that I keep not just community partners and organizations and nonprofits, but also my peers, you know, uh, young black professionals, young uh, professionals in general, abreast of the work that we're doing uh, and encourage people to you know, invite us into their space if they want to learn more. And so it kind of catches a natural organic momentum. Uh, in our presentations, again, we inform, we educate while also talking about a sensitive subject that many uh, people may try to steer away from. But you know, to Willie's credit, she takes the sky. And I think she's done an excellent job in uh, bringing in members of the, uh, the Presbytery from uh, Fran Lawrence to Reverend Jimmy Hawkins, uh, who uh, serves within, I'm trying to think of his particular role, Willie. What's Reverend Hawkins' particular role within PCUSA? Yeah public witness the public witness uh also doing a great job in bringing in um reverend jermaine alam ross alam who is now heading the center for uh repair for presbyterian church usa so we have invited and we've created relationships to try and uh get this information going in both directions, both the sky and the ground and all areas in between. Willie? Oh, I think you said it well. I just, um, one, one of the things I'll mention in terms of the encapsulating the whole piece is that, you know, we didn't just start um, one, you know, two years ago even. We didn't just start talking about this subject. And, you know, as we are living now where it is becoming more and more uh, popular to, to say, uh, let's not talk about that phase of history. You know, let's, let's uh, move on and not uh, ask anyone with feeling guilty or not, you know, and I, I, I want to say that we didn't start, I didn't start uh, two years ago, you know, it's been a long uh, um, piece of engagement where bringing folk, making folk aware of the history that has brought us to this inequitable state, and and that's that's really important because some, you know, I, as I talked and talk, talked and talked to people. Uh, the this, this state that we were in, there were many, many um, 
times when I'd see the light bulb go on and folk would realize that uh, this did not have to happen in a vacuum. You know, it didn't happen because somebody was mean, you know, just yesterday, but it was, it, you know, this whole historical piece of how we got to be where we are. And then um, ex ex explaining how we can move on and get rid of the guilt, get rid of the hurt, do the healing and, and reconciliation was key in our presentation to talk about how we can move the needle. Because I, you know, I, I'm firmly uh, convinced that folk don't want to live in this unfairness, you know, watching one uh, segment of the population exponentially thrive and watch another segment of the population be decimated uh, in, in uh, poverty or, or whatever the situation is. So um, the guilt many times, you know, folk talking about, well, I, my family wasn't involved or if my family was, you know, and many people are, are doing that research to find out how their families were involved and say, yes, it turns out my family owned slaves, for instance. But uh, this is what I can do. This is how I can try and heal and try and bring this to the forefront and say, aha, uh -huh, here's, here's something I can do. I can sell the rectory and give half of that to, or, 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 or all of it, to uh, a group that has not had the opportunities that I've had. You know, as, as we looked at the progression of um, impediments there, you know, um, so so bringing the truth to the surface and saying it happened, and what can we do to fix it? Let's move on. And so uh, I've I've been saying that, and and people are very. I've, I've been finding that congregations and individuals are very happy to have the conversation because it releases this pent up guilt. You know, nobody needs to live like that. That, uh, you know, oh, you mean my my family is the reason? You know, let's learn the history. It's what I say in seminars and in talks. Let's learn the history, and let's just let's get off our hands and say we're going to do something about it. And so that's how we come to the point we are with the Justice League. Is that um, many times you know it's so easy to to say. Oh, that was terrible. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow, you know, and go home and and not address the issue. But it's so rewarding. We have people come and tell us how rewarding it is, or people make commitments, that, you know, to, to, to donate X amount monthly for the rest of their lives, you know, to say, this is a way that I can do something about it. Because that's been the thought is that, yeah, this was awful, but there's nothing we can do about it. So, so I think that just coming to grips with the fact that we can um, hold each other dear, we can be one people as God intended, and we can right the wrongs. You know, we certainly want to be on that path. Uh, we won't we, we're not we're not saying we'll write it overnight, but we want to be on the path that repairs the breach. All I can say to that is amen. Thank you, Willie. We'll let that be the last word. So grateful to all of you for for joining us and providing your experience and your wisdom in this in this uh, journey. Uh, it's a journey that we're all taking together. We're all learning from each other. And we need to continue to learn from each other. This is this is not, and you've touched on this. This is not a a time bound exercise. This is not writing a check and being done with it. This is not limited to a particular time in history. Um, this is not just one particular wrong of slavery, even though that set the stage for a lot of other wrongs. These are wrongs that are continuing to happen each and every day, and so this requires a lot of fortitude, a lot of listening a lot of partnering uh, and walking with each other and a lot of love too, um, both in acknowledging how we've, how white churches have been part of this 
uh, this whole system and the oppression, and then also learning how to partner in new ways uh, with with their communities and making sure that they're working hand in hand to try to uh, stem the stem the tide of the continued injustices that happen every single day in this country. So so grateful for having all of you here. Um, going forward, I challenge those of you attending here. I challenge you to can continue the conversation within your own communities. You've heard uh, a lot of great information. I encourage book studies. I encourage however you engender those conversations. Um, just talk about it. As Willie said, you know, if having the conversation sometimes is, you know, people are more afraid of the of having the conversation than the conversation actually is. It's it's a bit of a, a relief, and it's also necessary to to learn these things and to know how we can affect change within our own communities. Uh, find out who's working in your own communities. I, I listed a couple of communities that are working at this. The Maryland Episcopal Diocese is working at this. Uh, communities of Evanston, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, in Illinois, in California, and other places. There are communities working through this. Um, and moving forward, those of us with the Interfaith Repertory Justice Table will be collating all the information that we've got here and continuing to collate information from different communities as we move forward. We're looking forward to hopefully having some additional webinars uh, from different communities to learn how, they, how they're doing it because everybody is doing it differently because every community is different and has different needs. So looking forward to continuing some of those conversations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this, will, this webinar will be back on YouTube this evening on NCC's YouTube channel at 7 p.m. So feel free to watch that. There's numerous other uh, webinars that we've held from prior times, use those as a point of discussion as well. And I just really just engage the process, ask the questions and listen uh, is the most important thing you can do. So thank you so much. I, I pray for you to have a, have a wonderful evening and thank you to our friends from Lansing. And I pray God's blessings on their ministry as well. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.